Welcome to Pinewoods Chapel. My name is Chris Atkinson and I'm the pastor of Pinewoods Chapel and I am so glad that you have connected with us today. At Pinewoods, we seek to serve our community and those who have a passion and desire to know Jesus and we would be happy to hear from you as we move closer and closer towards Easter. Today we've got a great time of worship prepared. If you need any kind of counseling, if you need any kind of help, if you just need somebody to talk to, you can contact our church in various number of ways, whether it's online or even in person. Let me take a moment and we'll pray as we get started today. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your abundance of love that you have towards humanity. Lord, I pray today that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up our minds to see you, to know you, to understand you. And Lord, that we would place our faith and our hope and our trust in you because of your goodness and your faithfulness. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Out to welcome you 
fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a great glimpse of an ever now to yours every fear bow down to your love that we could see like never before give us a greater glimpse of an ever-changing God Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and i love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was saved so i'll cherish the old rugged cross trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old crooked cross and exchange it someday for a crown oh the old rugged cross 
so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will claim cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then oh call me someday to my home far away where is glory forever I'll share so I'll change trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name the only one who could ever see worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up song we could ever sing, worthy of all the 
praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We're there for you. We're there for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Imagine what it would be like to live in a period of time where you don't fear. You don't lock your doors at night. You don't stress over anything happening in the life. And in fact, all of the leadership decisions, whether it's at work or in the world with the government that are made are good for everyone. They're fair and just. It's actually like living in this world of utopia. 
Could this even be possible in our world today? Well, one of the things that is so amazing about believing and trusting in the God of the Bible is that God promises humanity that there will be a period of time here on earth when this type of life where there's no fear, you don't have to lock your doors, you don't have to stress about life, will actually be normal everyday life. And it's during this time period that call, scholars call the millennium. Now, maybe you've been thinking, well, that sounds a little bit like heaven. Well, this is heaven here on earth. And this time that the Bible speaks of, we actually should know when it's going to happen. It would bring us great hope and great joy to be a part of living in this world here on this earth where people don't fear, where you don't lock your doors at night and you don't stress over life and you can trust the people that are in leadership. Well, as we've been going through this study on the book of Revelations, today we come to this portion of scripture in Revelation chapter 20 that actually speaks about this period of time called the millennial. Let me read chapter 20 of Revelation verses one through six, and then we'll begin to unpack this and understand what John saw when he saw this vision. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and have not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This millennial age refers to this thousand year reign of Christ that John sees in this vision as this angel comes down out of heaven and as he sees these thrones and people seated on these thrones and he explains to us what he sees. Now when we look back in the Old Testament we actually see a number of passages throughout the Old Testament that give glimpses that show promise of this millennial time. Only the book of Revelation in chapter 20 is the only place in the New Testament that actually talks in any detail about this time period. But what we see here is some amazing promises that God has promised us in this period of time. But for us today, we know that this is still yet to come. We definitely have not experienced anything like what we see here written. But what we do need to know is when? When will all of this take place? Well, there's four things that we can see right here in this passage that is very obvious to us that must take place before this millennial happens. And the first sign is that Satan is bound. The millennium will happen after Satan is bound. Notice verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. 
And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. It's pretty obvious that Satan can't be bound today. Why? Because one of the reasons why he's bound for a thousand years, why he's thrown into this bottomless pit, why he's shut up and sealed over, is that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Up until this point in Revelation, we've been going through all of these things that have been happening in this world, whether it has been the rise of the Antichrist or the fall of Babylon or judgment or persecutions that are coming on the church. All of this has been rooted in the fact that Satan has been deceiving the nations. And when we look around our world today, it's pretty obvious that Satan is still deceiving the world. The eyes of the understanding of people are still blinded to the truth and the hope of God. And Satan has been fueling so many things. And when we just think about lying, for example, Satan has been behind all of the lies that are in our world, all of the deception that is out there, the myths, information, the fake news, the, all of the things that seem so relevant to our day and age. Satan is behind all of those things. So it's obvious that he hasn't been bound. And it's obvious that the nations are still being deceived by Satan. So Satan can't be bound. But when Satan is bound, there is a massive change. There's a change that happens. And as we read through this, we see this massive change that comes about because... Satan is bound and he's not allowed to deceive the nation's humanity anymore. Here's another thing that must have happened before the millennial begins, and that is the millennial happens after the Antichrist is destroyed. Notice as we read verse 3, again it says that the Satan is bound and he's thrown into this pit and he's shut up and sealed so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. You see, the Antichrist is fueled by Satan. The deceptive powers of the Antichrist are the workings of Satan. We've talked about how in the other chapters in the previous weeks, we have talked about how the kings of this earth give their power and authority over to Satan. We've talked about how this beast, this Babylon, is really the outworking of Satan in our economy and governmental systems. We've seen that in the midst of all of what is going on, in the end, Satan is working. Right now, it's very obvious that the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world. Antichrist meaning people that are against Christ. It's on so many different continents, it's around the world, and it's obvious that that Antichrist spirit has not been destroyed. And it's the Antichrist spirit that then sets the stage for this Antichrist ruler that will rule a global world. And as long as the Antichrist is here or not here, as long as the mark of this beast, the mark of the Antichrist is in play, then the Antichrist is not destroyed. And the millennial will not happen until the Antichrist is destroyed. Another thing we see here as we continue to read through in verse 4 is that the millennium happens after Babylon falls. In verse 4 it says, Then I saw, so as John is unpacking this vision that he sees, he's seen this angel come down out of heaven with this big chain to bind Satan. He then sees these thrones, and it says, And seated on them were those who 
to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and have not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Here, we are told that Christ is reigning and that with Christ, there are believers who have been martyrs who were martyred because of the testimony of Jesus. They were also martyred because of the word of God. They stood up for truth. They were also martyred during the time of the Antichrist and the beast and they didn't receive his mark, and they didn't worship the beast. They were also included in this, who are present on the earth when the Antichrist was ruling. And what we see is that Christ is reigning with all of these martyrs in this thousand-year reign, as it's called. And in order to have Christ reign on the earth, there must be no other governing systems in the world. Babylon represents all of those governing systems. Babylon must fall in order to have Christ reign on the earth. And as we look back in the passages before Revelation chapter 20, that's exactly what we see has happened. Babylon has fallen. All of the economy has fallen, and Christ now steps in as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he reigns for a thousand years on this earth. This is not going to be ushered in by the conversion of the world by the church. We're not trying to Christianize Babylon. In fact, anything where we try and build some version of the millennial with our own hands and our own ideas, we actually miss the mark of what God has actually prepared and promised for the inhabitants of the earth during this millennial time period. To be sure, this millennial will be ushered in by Jesus himself. Jesus will be sitting on these thrones, as it says that there were people that were seated on these thrones to whom the authority to judge and to rule was committed. And until Babylon falls, this millennial is not going to happen. We need to be looking for these signs where Satan is bound where the Antichrist has come and been destroyed and where the systems of this world, Babylon, have fallen. But yet we're given one more sign before the millennial, and that is that the millennial happens after the first resurrection. As we continue reading on through verses 4 to 6, what we see is these martyrs who are physically dead on the earth, it says in verse 4, they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And in verse 5, it goes on to say that the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Think of that for a minute. These are people who gave their life to serving Jesus. And by serving Jesus, they were martyred. They were killed. But here, what we see happening is the same thing that happened to Jesus when he was crucified on the cross. He was resurrected. The spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus came and indwelt these, for lack of a better word, these dead people. And they were raised to life to have this spiritual resurrected body that wasn't the same kind of body that they had before, but it was a spiritual body. And it says that they get to rule and reign 
with Christ for a thousand years. That's what this first resurrection speaks of. Now we're told here that there are the rest of the dead don't actually come to life until this thousand year period of time is ended. Well, how many resurrections are there? Well, actually there's quite a few in scripture. We see this example of the first resurrection. We're actually told of a second resurrection that's coming in the next couple of chapters. But we also see other individual resurrections that have happened with Jesus, with also saints that were resurrected, so to speak, at the time of Jesus. But this is not the same as this phrase that we use in Christendom, the rapture. It's not the same. It's something totally different than what we see over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But this, as we're told right here in Revelation chapter 20, this first resurrection must take place before the millennial happens. Because those of the first resurrection are actually reigning during the time period of this thousand years. This time period of the millennial is this time of amazing peace. This time when people come and worship Jesus, to enjoy him, to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But in the midst of this, what we're actually told is that Satan has been shut up in this pit for a thousand years, but that he is to be released for a little while at the end of it. This time period of the millennial is an amazing promise. It can fill our hearts with hope in the midst of this world that is crushing us at times from just maybe living our life. We need to be in this place where we're watching and waiting for the signs that point to this coming age of peace. God has promised peace for those who love him, for those who fear him. And this picture of the millennial is this window into heaven. Actually, it's really a window into eternity and what eternity will look like as eternity goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. As we rule and reign with Christ, enjoying him and worshiping him and glorifying his name forever and ever. You see, the promises of God are not intangible. They become very tangible as we come to the end of the book of Revelation. We see all of the hope and the fulfillment that God has planned for humanity found in these chapters, in these verses. And if you have never given your life over to following Jesus, then you actually don't get to take part in some of these amazing promises of peace that God has foretold and promised. But if you have given your life over to Jesus, then you do, you do get to partake, you do get to look forward to these time periods of great peace, time periods of great joy as Christ rules and reigns. If you want to be a part of what God is doing in this world, it's easy to be a part of that by just confessing and inviting Jesus to come into your life, to put your faith and your trust in him, to believe what he's actually said in the Bible and that he's promised that he is coming back again and that he will judge the living and the dead but more importantly, that he gives you a reason to live today. This millennial is just a taste, just a deposit, just a down payment on what is coming as we spend eternity ruling and reigning with Christ. And God would love that everyone would be a part of that. And he would love for you to put your faith 
in your trust in him. And if you do that, you get to be a part of his family and what he's doing in this world. Let's pray and thank him for the amazing good that he has promised. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good that you promise us in your word. God, you've told us that these are things that are about to take place, and we trust you. We look forward to the hope of the millennial, hope of seeing peace on this earth, seeing your martyrs ruling and reigning with Christ, leading us as humanity in a governmental system where you are the head for you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Lord, we long for the day. We long to see you ruling and reigning as you ought to. Lord, prepare our hearts for this day. May we be able to see the signs of this day. May we be able to be prepared as this day approaches. And we thank you, God, for your promise of peace and hope in the midst of a world that does not give those things. So God, we give you praise and we thank you for your goodness. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. It has been great to be together today. I hope you've enjoyed our time of worship and opening up God's word as we have looked at the book of Revelation. On the screen, there are some questions for you to think about and maybe reflect on, talk to your family about, or others that you are in communication with. Know that you are loved by God and by those of us at Pinewoods Chapel. And we will see you next week, if not before. God bless.
church, there's now a very important step you need to take to make sure you're not missing important church updates on Facebook. Just open up the Facebook app on your phone, go to the church's page, click the like icon, then tap the three dots and tap the word following. Set the newsfeed option to favorites, live notifications to all, video notifications to all, and post to standard. Again, set the church's newsfeed to favorites and turn on all notifications. Now you're all set to stay connected and in the know.